our uh, 110 participants from yesterday have turned into the hardy few 50, um, sort of like Napoleon marching to Moscow, we're about to cross the Ukrainian border. But really they're missing out on what will be a fascinating discussion of um, you know, how we can formulate an xRNA data analysis challenge. So um, Gustavo Stolovitsky from IBM the TJ Watson Research Center, um, please take it away. Thank you, Roger. Let me share my screen. You can see? Yes, but not in presentation mode yet. All right, let me put in presentation mode. Oops. There, can you see? All good. All right, so thank you very much. It has been a very interesting workshop so far and uh, this is getting only better. Uh, I hope, uh, I, I'm just trying to present something to show the benefits of doing uh, benchmarking challenges and maybe something that could um, help uh, this field to some extent move even farther and faster. Um, so the question we are trying to ask is, can we use a crowdsourcing challenge to benchmark XRNA transcriptomics analysis? And uh, um, the outline is then uh, a general uh, view of benchmarking competitions as a path to reproducible research and a few examples where people really question the reproducibility of uh, research um, and, and try to how to try to avoid that. Then a few examples of dream challenges. I don't have time to go into details. There, most of this has been published, and um, and then you know um, start to whet the appetite of uh, the few remaining heroes that re that stayed in the workshop as to how uh, we can create um, XRNA. Um, uh, challenges to benchmark some of the experimental as well as the data analysis. And uh, hopefully um, uh, Roger will help us move forward in uh, some of this uh, ideation of the challenges. So, so let me start then with uh, one uh, slightly different from what we are doing here um, topic, which is the topic of breast cancer screening using mammography. Uh, towards the end of the year 2019, uh, there were a number of interesting uh, uh, papers that show different algorithms to um, uh, analyze uh, mammograms and, and uh, by doing by using machine learning, determining whether the mammogram indicated that the woman had cancer or not. And so you know, these are two, one paper in August, one paper in October, one paper, in April 2020, but on January 1st probably was the most important paper that, or at least the more visible paper because it was published in Nature by a group that hailed from Google research. And uh, soon after there was another paper that criticized bitterly that, that paper from the Google team, uh, basically not because the results were bad, but because the results were such that there was absence of sufficiently documented methods and computer code underlying the study effectively to determine whether the results were reproducible. And also the data they used in that paper, however beautiful that paper was in terms of its results, the data was not available, right? So how can, how can any of us trust? Because there is clearly a conflict of interest there. But um, that, that, that tells us something about a generic problem in, in research, which is that um, you know, we, um, we have to be much more open in terms of the code that we create, in terms of the data we used and so on. And, um, and how we evaluate our own methods, because if we, we cannot be really or it, it, it becomes suspect if we become uh, judge, jury, and executioner at the same time, right? If we evaluate our own algorithms. In any case, there was 
a little uh, commentary about um, this situation of many papers published in this field and, and, and lack of sufficient uh, transpar transparency. And uh, someone said uh, that, that uh, you know, the Google paper uh, made them realize that it was yet another example of a very high profile journal publishing a very exciting study that has nothing to do with science. That's what this person said. It's more an advertisement of cool technology. We can't really do anything with it. And probably the same happens in many areas of research to a greater or smaller degree. In contraposition to, to that situation, we have another very uh, successful uh, uh, result that, that happened, I think, in 2020 as well, about the solution to a problem that is a 50-year-old grand challenge in biology, which is the problem of um, inferring the folding of a protein based, based on the primary sequence of amino acids. And so, as you may know, some of you may know, there is a competition called CASP. Uh, CASP stars, um, stands for Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction, and it's an, algor uh, it's a, um, um, an effort that has been going on since, since 1994, and that uh, basically benchmarks protein folding algorithms. And the, the, in, the, in the bottom left, you see my cursor, Roger? I do, yes. Yes, okay. So. Here you see um, the results of um, the best algorithms that were submitted to CASP in terms of some metric that goes from zero, which is very bad, to 100, which is perfect. And you see that there was no real um, progress in, from 2006 to 2016, almost a decade, right? And then in 2018, uh, DeepMind, Propose this alpha fold, which again is a, um, a code that that whether it was or was not um, completely open to the public in terms of um, open sourcing it, it was tested in a completely open competition where everybody can submit and nobody had the result. And then in 2020, the alpha fold two get to almost as good to be as good as a prediction as the X-ray X crystals um, errors with respect to the position of the, of the residues and the atoms. So basically this shows that alpha fold has a solution to this problem, which is pretty accurate. And um, the important thing that I'm trying to highlight here is the fact that the way in which this solution was found was in a fair comparison between many, many algorithms that were submitted to try to solve the same problem. And this is the one that did best in a fair comparison where the data was open to everybody uh, and, and, and the solution was a fair objective comparison between all these uh, algorithms. So this is something that we have been um, very, uh, you know, consistently advocating for in the field of systems biology and, and, and genomics. So to take one step back and looking at the problem from a more uh, generic perspective, let's say that what we are trying to say is that crowdsourcing, that means uh, submitting, um, uh, accepting submissions uh, to the solution of a problem by many uh, groups, for benchmarking is a very good idea. So you have in general a generic problem. For example, the ERCC consortium is the organization that has a generic problem, an analysis, for example, of um, transcriptomics from uh, biofluids. And, uh, and you, you know the solution, at least in one instance, but, not, but in general, you are never sure what the result should be. And so you crowdsource that data Many people try to give you the solution and they, and they do give you the solution and you find the solution that best matches the approaches to the generic problem that you, uh, that you propose, but in your instance where you know the solution. So you get some sense that, well, in that case, we know which one is the best, probably uh, that's a good prior for using the same method or an aggregation of the best methods in the next time that they have to analyze the same data. 
This is a very simple-minded way of thinking. And you know, we uh, discussed this at length in one review article that we published a couple of years ago, uh, discussing you know, how we use this in almost uh, you know, 65 uh, up-to-date, 65 to 70 um, uh, challenges, one of which I think uh, was presented earlier in the workshop, uh, which was the uh, tumor uh, deconvolution challenge. So many people ask me, what is in it for the people that are trying to, to solve this? So there are many things. One thing is how accurate is their algorithm? That is something that they can answer themselves, but also they can, um, they can get uh, you know, great visibility by the fact that they solve this, this challenge. So the benefits of benchmarking by crowdsourcing is basically, um, and probably the most important, performance evaluation is unbiased. You can do an unbiased method assessment and determine who has the best way of solving or looking at this problem. And, and that benefits not just that group, but the community. You discover the best method and uh, puts to the test the solvability of a scientific question. You may find, as we did, that sometimes there is no signal in some genomics data when it comes to answer a particular question. For example, um, genetics will not tell us whether rheumatoid arthritis patients are responding to a particular type of, uh, of anti-inflammatories. That was what we found empirically. But other benefits of crowdsourcing are um, acceleration of research because basically you, all the, com the, the whole community you know, that, that are interested in, in solving this problem are working together. In a few months, we have a, a plethora of algorithms that are trying to solve something and we can comp compare them and learn from them all. And one thing that we are particularly interested in doing is building a community rather than even though we propose this as a competition, because that's the way in which people kind of independently can try to solve this, eventually we want people to talk to each other. We want to figure out what is the, what are the gems in the ways or in which people think, not to win, but actually to solve a problem. That's, that's the main thing. So the dream challenges, um, you have, um, you have the URL there, is, um, um, you know, is one of the ways in which uh, the communities have uh, looked into this. These dream challenges are mostly for genomics and systems biology problems and other biomedical problems. Stands for Dialogue for Reverse Engineering Assessment and Methods. The reverse engineering has to do with the fact that in, in the past we have been looking into trying to see, you know, what are the mechanistic um, uh, underpinnings of a particular data set, but we expand it to something which is a little bit less um, ambitious, if you will. We have thousands of registered uh, participants, uh, many challenges that we run that we, we learned a lot. Sometimes we make big mistakes, but we learn from these mistakes. Um, and all in all, I think that what we learn out of this is that we can work together in order to solve problems that seem very di difficult and give credibility to the results that we get in, in our particular fields. So the structure of a dream challenge is basically we have data and um, there is a ground truth, for example, who responds or doesn't respond to this anti-inflammatory or, or, or which are the fusions or uh, if you have um, an RNA uh, transcriptomics data, whether you can find fusions, and in some cases you can spike in fusions and you have a ground truth, but you don't tell the truth, you just give the data. And then people try to answer the question that you propose, and eventually you can objectively evaluate and, and do all the things that we said before in terms of collaboration, acceleration of research, and so on. So there are, there are um, problems with this in that, you know, sometimes people say, well, but if I give my data and I, before I publish, like for example, the CASP uh, people do, people might, might think, hey, but well, I'm going to lose the opportunity to really uh, benefit from that data that I, I created with a lot of work. And so in order to do that, we invented or we de developed a way that we call a model to data. The typical way to do it is the data goes to the modeler. And so the, you go to a database, for example, the XRNA Atlas, and you download the data, right, that you can use for training, validation. And then 
and, and maybe you also download uh, a, a, a validation data without having the labels, you know, the, the results that you want, but you have the data, the genomics data, and you send everything to the to the um, solvers and the solvers have their data, you can work with it and eventually we can uh, benchmark it. So all the data is widely accessible. There is no enforcement of model reproducibility because the only thing that you send is the results, you know, patient one responded, patient two didn't respond. And there is no prospective way of keeping that data for future benchmarking efforts. But the second way to do it is what we call the model to data challenge in which we protect the data, uh, pre-publication data by keeping that data completely private and people submit their models in a Docker container. And by doing so, uh, data will not leak outside of the people who have produced the data and therefore we honor the, 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 the possibility for people to actually publish this data without everybody else scooping them. And that's an important uh, consideration when it comes to people giving data for these challenges. Uh, you saw one challenge, uh, the, the uh, DNA, uh, the tumor deconvolution challenge, another challenge that we did in the area, recently in the area of um, cancer uh, is on uh, figuring out isoform quantification um, um, in terms of, um, you know, which, which in general is very diffi difficult to know, but, but you have to do a very particular um, way of figuring out how to, in one real case, figure out what are the isoforms and how to quantify them. The same was true for fusion, fusion detection. And we had very good uh, results here. The, the, the paper is if whoever is interested, we can provide it, is impressed in cell systems. So the final question then is, and, I'm, and this is my last slide, is can we use dream challenges for um, extracellular RNA? And I think that there are opportunities to uh, benchmark what, what are experimental um, um, difficulties in, 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 in making sure you know, that, that we get the same results. And if we don't get the same result, which result is, is better from which method? Computational um, uh, problems, you know, short RNA-seq mapping, comparison of methods and aggregation of callings and translational, you know, uh, uh, diagnostic uh, markers and so on and so forth. Very good. So these are the people who are doing actually the leadership of Dream Challenges, the, the chair of the Dream Challenges is Justin Guinea. I uh, founded the, the, the effort, but now I'm, I'm just a director along with uh, Paul Butros, Julio Saez Rodriguez, who's uh, attending this workshop, James Costello, Laura Heiser and Pablo Mayer, Julie Bletz is the director of operations. And thank you very much. Thanks, Gustavo. Um, I love your data to model uh, method where you provide complete sort of security for the data providers. I think that's essential and that's a great way to do it. Um, I'm going to give a quick presentation about, um, you know, possible specific xRNA related challenges that we could do. Um, I'm very much hoping that Gustavo's wisdom of crowds will improve upon my thoughts here because I don't feel like I quite have the answer. Um, but let's see where we get. Um, so um, we've had some good discussions. Um, the top two of these I'll describe in some detail and then below are, are I don't really have a complete understanding of how to turn it into a challenge, but I thought I would mention them for, for fun. Um, and so Gustavo mentioned biomarker discovery. <clears throat> I think that's a perfect um, challenge for our field. Um, deconvolution, basically taking a big data set and um, clustering the RNAs into tissue of origin or molecular carrier they're associated with that's something we might be able to um, turn into a challenge. Um, improving RNA annotations, comparing xRNA-seq processing pipelines, these are important problems in the field, um, but I don't quite yet 
know how to turn them into, um, put them in the format we would need to make a useful challenge. And maybe Gustavo and others can enlighten us about that or we can discuss it. So for a biomarker challenge, um, the goal is to develop a set of xRNA biomarkers that predict the presence or and or progression of a disease better than the current state of the art in clinical practice. Um, so the structure of a challenge like this would be you have a training data set, uh, a published data set. So for example, the XRNA Atlas is a great training data set for a number of different diseases. Um, uh, you have a published data set, let's say it's small RNA seq, which the Atlas is, majority of the Atlas is that. Um, you need hundreds of cases and hundreds of controls um, to train your methods. Um, if you wanna predict not just presence or absence of disease, but like disease progression or response to you know, therapy, um, you need longitudinal data and it's a sort of more difficult problem. And then the testing set you need is uh, you know, an unpublished data set of the same scale, hundreds of cases and controls of the disease of interest um, that you've found a lab that has the data and uh, um, is willing to you know, pause uh, in a, their publication cycle to uh, allow the community to work on it. So uh, I really thought we had a, we, I thought we had a good candidate. Um, this one isn't going to work. I'm just going to advertise the, the biology anyway. So uh, Louise Laurent at UCSD um, last year published um, a paper on biomarker prediction for preeclampsia in uh, pregnant women. And um, uh, we thought we had in the Atlas the hundreds of case and control data sets that we needed that were unpublished. Um, to create a great biomarker challenge, but it turned out that they were all already in the dbGaP pipeline. It's just that the dbGaP pipeline can be slow. And so this one isn't gonna work. So if you have a data set of this type, please let us know um, and we can talk to you about it. Um, yeah, so that's the problem. Um, Okay, so for deconvolution, the idea is we would want to separate extracellular RNAs into biologically meaningful groups. For example, the ones we've talked about today are um, finding tissue of origin of xRNAs or figuring out which molecular carriers groups of xRNAs associate with. Um, the structure of a deconvolution challenge, um, this, <laughs> this is a little bit, uh, simple-minded, but for a training data set, for a tissue of origin deconvolution challenge, you need a set of xRNAs where you know their tissue of origin. And if you're looking for, if you want to um, determine xRNA carriers from data sets, you need a set of xRNAs known to be associated with a particular carrier. Um, so where do we get those, um, you know, as was discussed earlier, where do we get those gold standard references? Um, so in tumor deconvolution, it was the responsibility of the teams to develop their training sets. And we heard Rongshan Yu say that, um, you know, they collected thousands of RNA-seq data sets and processed them. But, a, you know, a point of discussion for our community is if we had gold standard data sets in either or both of these cases, that would be really useful for the whole community, and I don't think we're there. But, but maybe, I mean, that's that's something to to discuss. Um, so, what would be what would the testing data set be for a deconvolution challenge? Something unpublished um, for tissue. I'm not exactly sure, but I suppose if you had a set of cell lines and you extracted xRNA from you know their um, from their supernatant milieu, then you could assume that those cell lines were in concordance with their tissue of origin and use that as a foundation. Um, for carriers, maybe if you have protein markers for particular classes of carriers, you could pull them down, sequence the xRNA. Um, and our ERCC2 is working, that's, is working to do that kind of thing. So I don't think we have anything immediately now, but 
it's something to keep track of. And another possibility um, to sort of circumvent the problem of not being able to find a good unpublished testing data set is you can make a synthetic um, deconvolution challenge. Um, but as Rongshan, you mentioned earlier today, that may end up being too easy. I mean, um, when the, the, the testing data set you synthesize just isn't quite real and maybe too linear and may just, it's the, I, I know that Gustavo and others have done synthetic data challenges, so I'm curious how that really works. Um, so that's everything I have. Um, and Gustavo and I now can sort of try and lead a discussion of, is there something people in the audience, is there a problem that we've missed that something more important than biomarkers or just something more interesting that we really should turn into a challenge? And the, the tricky issues for all of this are, you know, you need public data and you need private data to um, benchmark the algorithms and um, adapting problems, for example, improving RNA annotations, adapting that problem in, into this format is sometimes tricky. Um, and then again, finding the data is an issue. So um, I will leave it at that and see what people have to say. Excellent. Um, sure. Roger, okay. I see Julio is having a question or at least a comment. Hi, Julio. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks. So yeah, as Gustavo mentioned, I'm also one of the dream directors and I've been following these discussions. So I think, Roger, you did a very good summary of, of the status, but maybe a couple of comments on, on the data needed. Um, so just to be clear, we don't need necessarily, let's say, that all the test data is unpublished. So if we take an example, the preeclampsia data set, if there is some phenotype, for example, that was not published with the paper, but is interesting to predict, maybe another disease phenotype or something else, that could even work, right? So what is critical is that there is something to predict not in the public domain and, and not in the public domain in the duration of the challenge. Of course, the data generators can publish this. So it's sometimes a matter also of matching the timing. And I know, Roger, we discussed this before, but just for, for the broader audience, not that maybe people have data sets that, of course, they want to publish. And, We've managed many challenges to adjust the timing of the of the challenge to the own uh, publication strategy of data generators. That's maybe one comment that helps to shape things. And and about the in silico, um, I mean, I was involved in some and Gustavo in, in many others. As you said, Roger, indeed we have done this, and this is informative with the limitations that you also pointed out. Can be done in combination with real data, but um, in our cases, it was helpful for sure to move forward in specific questions, at least. Um, Julio, if I understand correctly, you're saying that in the preeclampsia data set, for example, all of the data could be public if there is interesting metadata that is not public? Exactly, right? Because the fact that all the molecular data is out, if you ask them to predict some metadata that is not out, uh, there's nothing limiting there. So um, I would I would open up because these these um, ideas um, are typically created by consensus by a community that need that have a need, right? So it's not uh, it could be a top down kind of data set that we present to the community, uh, but but it would be great that you guys um, formulate what you perceive is uh, important problems that, you know, different people analyzing the same data will get different results and one wonders which one is the right one. Um, so I would love to hear Roger uh, from, from this community, what they think is a right problem, even if we don't have the data yet, rather than say, let's see what data we have and do this challenge, let's say what challenge we should do and, and let's then try to find the data. Sometimes that works too. I'd like to comment on the first uh, challenge type, the biomarker discovery. Um, and I have a observation that 
that one may actually include deconvolution as perhaps a method to arrive at a biomarker, you know, by eliminating variants due to uh, variance in the abundance of particular carrier type, for example. Um, another question I have about that one, which really is the main concern of the community, you know, most of the studies in the external atlas really are case control studies, right? So I would say that we have the challenge of the biomarker discovery type will address the, the key concern of the community and we'll be glad to, you know, integrate any of these methods in the atlas as a useful tool. So that could be an useful byproduct of what you're doing. Uh, also, today and yesterday, we've seen that even RNA processing, you know, is not a completely solved problem, right? We started with excerpt with fixed annotations. You know, picking the annotations also feeds into biomarker discovery, right, in a way, because if you are not um, aggregating, you know, reads around specific informative annotations, you'll probably not discover the biomarker. So it's almost like, uh, you know, annotation problem, processing problem, the convolution problem, they all actually um, can potentially uh, improve, you know, biomarker discovery, if conceived as starting from scratch, right? Here the sequences uh, discover the biomarker, right? So it looks like if we want to make it uh, a completely open, you know, problem, you can start with here are the reads, for cases and, and controls, right, build a model. Um, you know, you may use annotations, you may use processing pipelines, you may apply the convolution, whatever it takes, right, for you to discover the best biomarker. Um, just thinking aloud, right? But in terms of the deliverable, I, I see two types of deliverables. One is set of features that are informative, and second is the model, right? Uh, and I was wondering if you had similar situations in the past. Let me just give you a, a, a scenario where you are looking for a set of up to 20, you know, most informative features, right? Um, in that case, you'd be testing these features by, uh, on the unseen data set by building your own model, right? Based on unseen data using a standard script, for example, something like, you know, a generalized linear model, for example, and so on. So everybody would be aware of it. It's clear that you're not building a model that would predict in the unseen data set. You're just providing, you know, a limited set of informative features, which are then tested in this independent data set. That would, in a way, allow one to hide, you know, the unseen data, right? So the data doesn't need to be seen. You're just predicting which features uh, are going to be informative and how to process the data and so on. Uh, but um, but also you'll be uh, in a way guarding yourself from the variation in the depth of sequencing or other parameters which may affect predictiveness of your model if it were full, fully specified. Whereas if you're comp making a complete model, then you know the the algorithm that, that is lucky enough you know to have guessed uh, you know the uh, the specifics of the new data set may win just because it has made a correct prediction. Whereas predicting a set of informative features will be a little closer to something objective in a way that's not so sensitive to the uh, specific uh, depth of sequencing, uh, read lengths, and so on that may uh, be used in the unseen data set. So these are my my thoughts, and I don't know if anybody has, has comments about it. And specifically, I only have one question. You know, have you had challenges where the challenge is not the predictive model, but informative features? And the, the answer is yes, um, Alex. We have done several of those challenges. One was about digital biomarkers in which we basically asked people to submit um, a features. And we made three sub-challenges, I think. One in which we asked to, for them to submit 10 features or less, 20 features or, or 100 features or less, and then any number of features. Because, you know, you always want to economize number of features in order to be, uh, you know, when you, if you want to translate this, you, want, you don't want 1,000 features, you want 10, right, or, or, or three. 
And yes, we they submitted features, and what we did was creating a kind of an ensemble of methods that eventually um, would uh, all the methods would train with those features, right? Or would test with those features, and. Um, and yeah, we had two or three of those challenges. One was a digital um, uh, biomarkers for Parkinson's disease using um, cell phone data. The other one was about um, what we call gene essentiality. And I don't know whether I'm forgetting anything, Julio, if you remember, but at least those two for sure. I, I think there was more. It's possible. So you homogenize the model, the same model for everybody, and people submit features. And then the, the best set feature set wins, so to speak. We we uh, uh, you learn a lot also from the from that. We did that also for the single cell transcriptomics, um, special transcriptomics. Remember um, um, Julio as well, right? In which we were asking for uh, something something like features for reconstructions of cells of of a, a Drosophila embryo, and. Um, and um, I think that the interesting thing there was to see which of the features that people send kind of are systematically there, present, right? Are in 80% of the submissions or in 70% of the submissions. So you have a sense of the importance of each of the features, uh, whichever means they use to do a feature selection. If I understand correctly, in that kind of challenge, the deliverable, the deliverable would not be a tool you could distribute that any lab could apply to their data, it would be biological knowledge about what they should look at. And it sounds like that might be a way to, for example, improve RNA annotations. I mean, you know, the features could be what are the housekeeping genes that are found in every vesicle? What are the housekeeping genes that are found only in vesicles that the liver secretes? Something like that. Is that a possibility? Yes. Uh, that is totally a possibility, but the, the question there would be, how do we know that what we say is true, right? There has to be a follow-up and some hypothesis that, that is testable or refutable. Yeah, I think that would involve, well, I mean, I'm thinking the, the pull downs uh, for tissue of origin is something I can imagine. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, again, that's, that's the crux, like, uh, how do you get that that ground truth testing data set? Um, I, I think that um, uh, Mina Kumari had a comment or question about um, data sets for deconvolution. Hello, this is Mina from Mina Kumari from uh, Kansas State University. I enjoyed all the talks today. My question is, you know, how many data sets or how many biological replicates would you need for deconvolution? Maybe that's a question for uh, Brian or for Alex. Well, for exec, uh, rule of thumb is 20, <laughs> but it's a rule of thumb, you know. So there are a lot of variables. One is how many genes are informative, vary between constituent components. The second is uh, what's the variability in the sample to sample variability. The more variability there is, you know, the fewer samples you need to deconvolute. Uh, and then uh, how accurate is your quantification? So depending on the answer to these questions, you would get you know, different number of samples that are required. And then on top of it, you know, what's the resolution of your deconvolution? Uh, do you want to resolve components that are up to, you know, 30% or up to 5% uh, of the of the tumor, uh, or do you want to go to 1%? You know, the, the higher the resolution, the more samples you'll need. So these are basically parameters that, that involve um, experiment design. So maybe, Brian, do you have other? Alex, thank you very much. You know, I, I don't work with tumors or, or in cancer field. I work in addiction field, uh, addiction to drugs of abuse. But right now I'm working with the cell line 
that is very well characterized and I have three biological replicates. Do you think I can use that data to, to see uh, how different exosomal RNAs are grouped together? You know, different classification. I know that the number that has changed between two cell types, but I do not know how to classify them according to their function. I, I don't well, know. Well, uh, supervised, supervised methods, you know, supervised methods may be able, you know, if there is an existing model, you may be able to fit your samples to a model, but uh, reference free methods or unsupervised would need more samples than that, I would say. I see. So, what will be the minimum then? I even if I work with primary cells or a cell line, that does not change. I mean, there will be some changes as you increase the passage, but those, those changes may be minimal, not such drastic changes as you, as you will see in tissue samples, for example. So what will be the minimum number? Because I am planning for my experiments and I like to know this so that you know I have the correct number of uh, re yeah. biological replicates. <laughs> It will be very hard, very hard to give the number, I think, without additional information for the reference-free method. Yeah, you know, I'll, very I'll, hard. I'll follow up with you. Um, maybe we can get an answer or have a discussion. Um, uh, but let me let me ask your question, uh, maybe a provocative question. Um, and it starts with it starts with a question to Gustavo. What you 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 mentioned in your um, talk you sort of listed issues and problems in our field and one of them is experimental i mean you know we have a lot of of um issues developing the best protocols and so forth um and you know those are not problems that i suppose you could form a protocol development challenge but that is not the kind of thing that we're talking about here we're talking about algorithm development um and so my question is is our field really in the position where we really need to resolve some of these experimental issues first? Is the biomarker prediction challenge actually not difficult and we're only grasping at it because it's one we can understand um, how we can formulate a challenge around it and might find the data sets? Sorry, Julia, Gustavo, I, I muted you a second ago. Yeah, yeah. Julia, you want to. Uh... Take this, or I, I can. You can, uh, but I think that there is truth to what you say, Roger. No, and uh, this certain level of, of pragmatism, or or what can be done over maybe what is the more fundamental question. But uh, I, as long as it's a valuable question for your community and it helps you move forward, uh, uh, one can do that first, and maybe in the meantime keep thinking of of how to go to the more funda fundamental questions. Um, and I wanted to make a comment briefly also back uh, to Alex's question about the, um, the, the biomarkers. That b besides posting explicitly the search for biomarkers in the challenge uh, and complementing this, one can also post challenge work on analyzing with the best teams. And we do this often in the challenges to understand what are the key features of the models. And then by this, you can then have more refined or different types of biomarker sets, but also you can understand more of what's happening, which may, can again maybe allow us to go a bit more from the biomarker, uh, less scientific question in that sense to the to more uh, deeper and molecular understanding. But sorry, Gustavo, maybe you want to elaborate. Sorry, here. Um... Okay, a, a few comments about, for example, what Mina asked. I think that you cannot uh, answer um, how many unless you have a better defined problem, right? Like, for example, like Alex said, you know, the, the, the errors of your measurements and so on. And so, but, but if you have, it's like doing a power analysis, real, really. You have to have um, some assumptions and then you can do a power analysis. But in principle, this is something that one could do once you, you have a preliminary data, for example. The, the issue that uh, Roger brought is, uh, can you 
start to do any challenge if you don't trust the measurements that you're creating that somehow they are variable and depends on what um, um, what you know RNA isolation or, or method of um, you know uh, processing your your libraries and so on um, it is true that that is that is going to always be a problem but if you define a data set then you know you are within the realm of something then you can uh, uh, once you choose the algorithms that, for example, find the biomarkers, the features, the deconvolution, then you can try to use the same algorithms in a subsequent problem of if what if you used a different method of library preparation, for example, right? Do, do I get the same results or not? Um, ideally, you can, you know, we, we once wrote a grant to do all these things, right? All these things should be done together, but, but in a way you can also do it sub, um, subsequently. Um, the final thing that I wanted to say is, I definitely think that the very low hanging fruit, there are two very low hanging fruits that I would, I would encourage this community to really think seriously. Don't dismiss the, the synthetic data. And it doesn't need to be completely synthetic. You can aggregate um, data, for example, that in themselves probably they have not been published in different labs. For example, you may have short RNA sequencing of lipoproteins or of uh, um, RNA binding proteins or of exosomes or bigger vesicles. And then you can aggregate them together and the convolution will be, tell me, which uh, which uh, carriers do you find there? It's in a way what you did in the cell paper in which you kind of figured out which um, which carrier types were depending on what you had measured. But in this case, you can put together a data set from where you know something and then see whether the convolution gets what you know it's there. But also that, that is a synthetic way of doing it even though it's analyzing experimental data. But also you can, start as we did when we we didn't know how to reverse engineering biological networks nobody knew you know what is connected with what what, what is the basic transcriptomic uh, regulatory network of different organisms or, or mammalian cells um, then you create to the best of your know, knowledge a synthetic data data set so to, to exercise the imagination of the, of, of, of the community interested in that, and you might find surprising things. For one thing, you can publish this in very well, very good journals if the problem is interesting, which I think in this case it is. So in itself, the effort is, is paid for, but also you elicit a lot of algorithm development beyond what is already done that you can start to compare and, and value. And, and, and then eventually there may be you know, better gold standards where they, they can be applied. So I would say, please don't dismiss a synthetic, um, a, a, a challenge based on synthetic data or in data created apropos of the, of the problem that you have. And the second low hanging fruit is the biomarker discovery. As, as uh, Alex said and, 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 and uh, Julio emphasized, I think that's, that's kind of easy. And it's important because it will allow you to show the importance of, of um, accessory RNA for actual objective evaluation in a blind data set that you can do. Uh, actually, you can believe the accuracy with which your, your um, algorithms or biomarkers are, are um, predicting you know, the, 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 the condition. Uh, because you do this in a completely blind way. And so that is where things start to look like a clinical trial. Um, so, so I think that is, that is doable. The only thing is we have to get data. And, uh, and that's, that's where um, you know, the question have to start to be how many data sets do we have that people can offer republication? And uh, like I said, it's, it's uh, with complete privacy protection and, and uh, honoring the, the right to publish first uh, that data for the data producers. Thank um, you, these, these comments are very helpful. I did the power analysis and it showed me that I need to prepare 20 libraries for each sample. And my other question to all of you is, 
you know, we, we analyzed the uh, RNAs enclosed in exosomes. We try to, you know, use them as uh, uh, to identify them as biomarkers, you know, if we are lucky. But my question is, I am not so much interested in, you know, identifying XYZ as a biomarker for addiction or for anything. But my goal is to understand the biological significance of these RNA molecules that are tra traveling or that are passed on to, to recipient cells from the parent cells. Mina, what I would say in response to that is that um, our experience in the ERCC consortium has been uh, there's this dialogue between the biomarker and therapeutics community. So basically finding a set of biomarkers or say one particular biomarker is yes. a good first step. Um, but then you really do need to understand the biology of it. Um, and there's, you know, especially if you want to take that biomarker and try to turn it into a therapy that a, a target for, um, you know, healing. And I, I don't think there's any substitute for, you know, just the the bench work on on that at that point but you the biomarker is a, is a beginning i see so so here is what i did i have one cell line that can be transformed into neurons so i took these two populations isolated their exosomes and looked at their uh, ex exosomal rnas and i do see there is a significant or actually uh expression or inclusion of uh, specific um, microRNAs and non-coding RNAs in neuronal exosomes and not in the, in the undifferentiated cells. So I can say that these can be used as biomarkers. And there are quite a few and, and the increase is from zero to uh, very high levels in uh, neuronal uh, exosomes. So I think I have not published this data yet. I'm just still working on because I, I looked at the, uh, I tried to understand the biological significance in terms of what these exosomes can do to each other, to each other, you know, these two cell population and how the uptake is of these exosomes. So first I looked at the uptake of the exosomes and then I looked at the, you know, what changes they bring to these cells. And I have some good, good, good data, I mean, uh, from this uptake. Uh, but well, I do uh, not Mina, know. excuse me. Um, hey, Mina. We're off topic, Mina. Um, I, I'm happy to talk to you offline about um, okay. these issues, but Sounds we really good. need to focus on, um, you know, creating a data analysis challenge in the field. All right. Know? Okay. Um, that sounds good. Um, Gustavo, I wanted to respond to you. I thought of an answer to my own question, the provocative, you know, is a biomarker challenge too easy? And I think the point is, given the kind of data that we have and the noise that's in it because of the difficulties in experiments, um, developing algorithms to solve the biomarker problem, you know, sort of provides a foundation for the field to say, well, these these experiments are good enough for us to find these, um, for us to find these findings. Um, and then as you point out, you can then have a, a, an upward spiral of, well, then you can use the algorithms as a baseline to tweak experimental inputs and see, see the impact it has. So um, I think you're right. We just need to find a good data. I think we absolutely, know the parameters of a biomarker challenge. We just need to find a data set. And um, um, I guess we can keep talking about, you know, billboards in Times Square. I mean, what, what, what do we do? Um, well, uh, we have a lot of metadata that we're actually not using. For example, age, you know, gender, um, you know, uh, and thinking about we have, uh, you know, these are known metadata that can be used for training, but I imagine, you know, test sets could be available where this metadata is hidden and used for, you know, validation. So, a clock, 
clock of pregnancy, for example, in a preeclampsia had women at different stages of pregnancy. Can we, you know, predict a uh, week of pregnancy and use um, metadata that's not shared as part of this study, you know? Alex, aren't we prediction? our own worst yeah. enemy there, though? Because the Atlas has such a thorough metadata submission process that I feel like all of that is already going to be public in most cases, no? Right, right. What I'm saying is it is public, but it could be that their data sets uh, where this data could be withheld even after publication and can be used to test the prediction, is my point. Uh, I'm not saying these are the best data, but it speaks to this possibility that even the if pub data is published, as long as some metadata is withheld, it could still be used for the challenge, right? Right. So, so that's maybe we have two approaches to a, a biomarker challenge, finding data or being clever about um, finding hidden metadata. Um, and Gustavo, I like your, I think we should push forward on both of these low hanging fruit challenges. I think that the deconvolution challenge to me, you, you know, um, finding tissue of origin and associating groups of RNAs with their carriers are vitally important issues in this field. And if we can use a synthetic data challenge to push forward just a bit our understanding of algorithms to do that, I think that's useful. Um, and might even hopefully um, feed back into improving the gold standard annotations. Um, I think that it, so we should end, we should end the workshop. Um, does anybody have sort of final thoughts on this issue um, before we wrap up? No, I think it's, you know, all the discussion was very useful. I think we're, we're getting some very useful direction from Gustavo and Julia and uh, maybe you can solicit some feedback from participants offline, no? So to hear from those who haven't stuck with us until yeah. this moment, there's about 30 people. I've so asked, I've asked for data, some data holders to send me their contact info. So I'm sure there's several of them already in my inbox. I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> interacting with them. Um, so thanks everybody for the discussion and um, we will be in touch um, on next steps, I guess. And I guess we have to say thank you, Roger, for organizing this, this workshop, which was very, very useful and interesting. Great. I, I hope it was. We'll, we'll do more of them. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, very good. Thanks, Roger. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Bye.